Hello and thanks for listening. As starships are built and tested, and the colonization of the solar system may soon be at hand, we should consider what type of government these colonies will have. While colonies on the moon will almost certainly remain under full Earth governmental control, with limited independence for a long time, Mars is a different story. Mars is far enough from Earth that a high level of independence will be necessary for colonists to succeed. Elon Musk and others have said that they would like to see a system of direct democracy. Let's look at how these systems of government have evolved in the past. Plato was a brilliant man, but he did not trust democracy. In his treatise, The Republic, he thought the best form of government would be a benevolent dictator. But history has shown that the problem is not finding a dictator, but finding one that stays benevolent. The Soviet Union was, at one time, the largest nation on Earth. It had been formed by the followers of Karl Marx, who taught in his book Das Kapital that society would eventually evolve into a system where the workers owned the means of production. This system was supposed to be the opposite of dictatorship, a complete democracy, where committees of citizens would be in control and everyone would have what they needed to live comfortably. This sounded like a great plan to many of the men and women who were starving in Eastern Europe. Two of these men were Vladimir Ilyich Ilyanov, better known by his alias Lenin, and Leon Trotsky. These men lived in Russia and had read the works of Marx. They disagreed with Marx about waiting for this society to naturally evolve. At this time in history, Russia was ruled by a class of hereditary dictators. When someone's word is law, they are a dictator. That is literally what the meaning of the word is. They may be called an emperor, king, czar, or even president. But if their power is unchecked, they are dictators. By the way, the Russian word for king, czar, comes from the Roman term for an emperor, Caesar, or Kaiser as they probably pronounced it. It's the same root for the German Kaiser. These dictators may be considered benevolent and wise, like Marcus Aurelius, or despotic and evil, like Caligula. The Russian dictators, or czars, were not at all popular with the common people by the end of the 19th century. Those who wanted change, like Trotsky and Lenin, started speaking out against the czar. For this, they were both thrown in prisons, Trotsky in Siberia, and Lenin in Shushinskoye. Lenin served his time, and Trotsky escaped, and they met for the first time in London, England. There they both continued their study of Marxism and became convincing speakers. Trotsky went back to Russia and led a revolution to overthrow the Tsar in 1905. This revolution failed, but it weakened the government significantly. Lenin joined a group of communists called the Bolsheviks, which took over from the group Trotsky had joined, called the Mensheviks. The Bolsheviks felt that more force was needed. One member of the Bolsheviks was skilled at applying force. His name was Joseph Jugashvili, and he had been a member of the Bolsheviks for 12 years. He had been in charge of conducting clandestine operations against the Tsarist forces. In 1917, Lenin led another revolution, and with the help of his right-hand man, Jugashvili, this one succeeded. The Soviet Union was born, and the communists shared power with a group called the Left Socialist Revolutionaries. Committees were set up and power was centralized. These committees were placed in charge of reallocating resources and controlling industry. But the wealthy and middle class were not as enthused about sharing everything. They had done okay under the Tsar and didn't want their property taken. Lenin debated with them and eventually fought with them, leading to three states breaking away. Lenin decided more force was necessary. He outlawed all political parties except the Communist Party and created a secret police to root out those not loyal to his revolution. These people who objected were rounded up and sent to the exact prison camps in Siberia that the Tsar had used. Trotsky saw this and spoke out against it, and was himself hunted down and murdered in Mexico in 1925 by a Soviet operative. Lenin rewarded those who supported him with better positions and gave them control over certain industries, creating a new class of privilege in a supposedly classless society. These Communist Party officials were allocated automobiles and could shop at special stores, privileges the common people did not have. Millions starved as the economy became inefficient, and large productive farms were split up and the land allocated to the control of people who had never farmed. 
Eventually, Lenin became ill, and more of the responsibility of running things fell to his right-hand man, Joseph Jugashvili, who had started calling himself by a nickname, the Man of Steel, or just Stalin. When Lenin died, Stalin took over, and having no checks on his power to liberate the people, went about liberating them from their property, freedom, and often their lives, becoming one of the most murderous dictators in Earth's history. I use this example to show that abstract conclusions about the future can be seen by some as absolute destiny. That the best of ideas, when enforced without compassion, can destroy the lives of millions. One example does not always prove that an idea is unworkable. We have only to look at the nation of Switzerland to see direct democracy in action. The Swiss Confederation is controlled by a seven-member federal council established in 1848 that serves as the head of state. This type of collegial government had been a part of Swiss culture for thousands of years. This power sharing had worked well for them, and had kept them safe from the despotic whims of any one person. The most similar example of this type of government elsewhere in the world is probably the Iroquois Confederacy, formed in 1142 AD by five distinct Native American nations. This league was governed by a grand council of 50 elders, all elected to represent the different clans of the five nations. The Iroquois Confederacy was very powerful when Europeans started coming to North America in large numbers and controlled most of the Upper East Coast. The Confederation signed a treaty with the British, and the Iroquois aided in the establishment of British colonies throughout what would be later called New England. When the British lost the American Revolution, they did not invite their allies to the negotiating table, instead ceding five million acres of Iroquois land to the new United States. The Iroquois Confederacy, after serving its people well for over 600 years, was finally dissolved. This type of power sharing seems to form the most stable governments. Rome had a form of government called representative democracy, though not everyone could actually vote. Representatives called senators were elected to represent the people. Consensus decision-making is stable but slow, and during times of crisis, the Roman Senate would select a short-term emergency manager. This person would be selected for a period of time not to exceed one year, and was given the authority to pass emergency measures or temporary laws to swiftly handle the emergency. Since this person's word could create law, the position was given the name Dictator. Dictators were selected and resigned periodically throughout the 450-year history of the Roman Republic, until some generals were so popular that the Senate decided to break the term limit rules and allow some of them to stay on for more than a year. When the Senate finally tried to get one of them to step down after several terms, it did not go well. We know this general from history as Julius Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. The Senate tried to regain authority, and Caesar was assassinated. But once you concentrate too much power in the hands of too few, it is not easy to get it back. The Roman Republic fell to another Caesar, and Rome remained an empire until its last city was conquered about a thousand years later. As a note, the United States was not a true democracy when it was created in 1783. Less than 20% of the population were allowed to vote, disenfranchising all minorities and women. While the Iroquois Confederacy had been a true democracy, women had an equal part in all decision-making in Iroquois society, and heritage was matrilineal. Full democracy would not exist again in the United States until 1962, when Native Americans were finally allowed to vote in the state of Utah. The Swiss example of government has survived to this day, weathering the storms of World War I and II. Women were finally allowed to vote in Switzerland in 1971. In Switzerland, the entire federal council is responsible for leading the administration of the country. Each councillor is elected to head one of the seven executive departments of government. The position of president of the Swiss Confederation rotates among the seven councillors on a yearly basis. Switzerland is not a representative democracy like Rome and the United States. Switzerland is a direct democracy. The people do not elect representatives to decide on policies. People themselves make policy decisions by either referendum or initiative. Some states in the United States allow this type of citizen participation, where a law that gets enough signatures will be put on the next ballot, and if it gets a majority of votes, can become law. The most recent examples of this are marijuana legalization laws in the United States. There are also many examples, however, of elected representatives in the United States nullifying the law passed by the people. The best example of this recently is when the people of Florida voted by referendum to allow former prisoners to vote again, only to have the politicians modify the law, so that it would be a crime to vote if the former felon had any unpaid fees in any court system, with no provision for the felon to check and be absolutely sure that they did not. 
I bring up these examples because we must decide beforehand what form of government we want off-world colonies to have. Elon Musk has suggested direct democracy, which would look a lot like Switzerland. But a democracy can quickly destroy the rights of minorities in the society if something doesn't prevent it. This is where constitutions come in. Someone who serves in the American military does not pledge to defend the nation. We pledge to defend the Constitution. This is very different from most nations on Earth. The Constitution defines and limits the powers of government. The American Constitution divides control between three equal branches of government and ensures the rights of every individual. Now, to be effective, a Constitution must be enforced. While the Declaration of Independence said that all men were created equal, the original Constitution of the United States said otherwise. Other nations have this problem also. Citizens of North Korea have a constitution that says all citizens have equal rights, freedom of religion, and freedom of speech. That is not what we see reinforced there today. These examples prove that it is not what a government says, but what it does that matters. Without limited power, governments tend to degrade to dictatorship, as North Korea most certainly is. Mars and the Moon will almost certainly be colonized by cities established by nation-states from Earth. These nations will include the United States, China, the European Union, Russia, and eventually India and other Asian, African, and South American nations. Each of these cities will grow to become a type of city-state, reflecting the laws and cultures of the nations that created them. These colonies will, however, have to depend on each other for support, almost as much as they depend on Earth. If there is an emergency, help from Earth will not get there in time. A frontier mentality between the colonies will quickly develop. Now please understand what a frontier mentality is. Texas is where Elon Musk has decided to put the company that will build starships and establish the foundations that will become a civilization on Mars. Some of my ancestors have a long history in Texas. Some of them very long, in fact. Texans today pride themselves on being self-sufficient and independent. These are definitely examples of frontier principles. Pull your own weight. Try not to be a burden on others. But some modern Texans, and especially their politicians, tend to ignore many other frontier traits, such as letting people live the way they choose, and helping your neighbor when things go bad. Texas is no longer the frontier in America, and if your car breaks down in some states, it might be a long time before anyone stops and offers to help, if ever. But if you go to Alaska, or even Montana, you will find that when your car breaks down, someone quickly stops to help. A major factor in the frontier mentality is that you all help each other, because someday the person needing help will be you. Too much can go wrong on a frontier, and Mars will be as isolated from Earth as the early European colonies were in the United States. Eventually these colonies will form a system of government where each colony preserves its unique traditions while supporting the others. The Federation, I hope they call it. The Federation of Off-World Colonies, maybe. What they call it will be much less important than what it will represent. A place for those who want to build something new to go. A frontier where those who feel unappreciated by their own cultures can start over and have value. A place where no matter what they were before, they can become something new. A citizen of Mars. A new world which might someday exceed the accomplishments of Earth itself. And finally build a civilization where, hopefully, there will be liberty and justice for all. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Support us on Patreon if you can. There is a link in the description. And stay safe at Astro Proterra.